one. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is antiques expert Andrea Zemmel and author actor George Carr. Andrea Zemmel, am I saying this right? Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> Was raised in Philadelphia and earned her Master of Fine Arts from the University of Pennsylvania. Then she went back to the university to teach in the graduate program. What were you teaching? Well, I proposed a, a class, uh, a new program called Community Collaborative and Public Art. It was uh, a class that actually went out into the community and involved high school students, community members, and college students. And uh, we did site-specific collaborative pieces that were permanent and placed in the community. Oh, you did? Mm. So they were sculptures? Yes, sculpture, and I also taught drawing. Did you? Mm -hmm. Well, did the, the drawing lead to you're working in a design studio, working with furniture, working in design? Well, my, my background as an artist, I've been a practicing artist for 20 years. And uh, in 1997, when I met my current husband, Adam Brown, and he was at the time an antiques dealer, and I got involved in the business with him, it was a wonderful adventure. And that's Iliad Antique? That's Iliad Antique, yes. Um, I keep wondering about Iliad. Is it back to Greek time? Well, we both have a love of mythology. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, Biedermeyer Furniture, which is what we, we sell, um, is, is a neoclassically inspired form. So the Iliad really has to do with uh, the, the classical inspiration of Biedermeyer Furniture. I see. But, but back to your drawing, because yes. it, you, you have been a practicing artist for 20 years, but now you're doing furniture, mm -hmm. or were you doing for making furniture before? Well, actually, I, I was doing some lighting. I had been an artist and resident in a welding shop for five or six years. Oh, so you worked with heavy pieces. I worked with heavy pieces. And just for myself, for fun, I would um, make lighting and make pieces, pieces um. of sculpture that were very much like furniture forms. And uh, mm -hmm. all the skills that go into drawing and creating three-dimensional pieces are just translated into making furniture. So when you went into making furniture and you used European uh, methods when you're making your furniture, how did you learn those things? Well, actually, we have a workshop uh, that does the restoration of our antique pieces. And I started designing furniture, actually, as a result of designers coming to me and saying, um, you know, I can't find a king-size bed in a Biedermeier form. I'm going to show form. your king-size bed <laughs> in a Biedermeier form. So uh, we had our European craftsmen create these pieces. I would do the drawings to specification, and they would create the pieces for me. And so you use the same, do you use the same type of wood? We have the picture on the screen now. So do you use the same type of wood that would be found in an old Biedermeier, Biedermeier piece? Well, it's the same type of wood, the, with the exception that the older pieces were cut from trees that were already probably 500 years old, um. and those, that's 200 years ago, so it was old growth veneers, oh, whereas now the veneers may not be as old, but they're still veneered pieces of furniture, um. and the method is the same. Tell me what you think. Is it just as important to own a piece like this, which is designed by you, or say a copy of uh, antique furniture? Does it matter if it's new, or is it always better to have the old piece? Well, of course it matters if it's new or old. The antique piece has an intrinsic value because of its age. Um, a new piece can have its own value as a unique design. However, if you took it to auction, it's not going to, at this point in time, maybe 50 years from now, it'll have a value of that sort. But at this point, if you took it to auction, it wouldn't have the same value that an older piece would have. So when, when you start, when your interest in furniture happened, was it other furniture, or was it always Biedermeier furniture? Um, Were there other 
Well, for ideas. example, there's a, a chair here that I designed for a designer. The client purchased uh, an antique piece that was a dining table. He needed a set of 14 chairs. Uh -huh. And with Biedermeyer chairs, you can't find a set of 14 chairs. Right. It's very, very difficult to find. So um, the designer had me design something that was based on more of an Art Deco Ruhlman design. Oh, that's what I thought uh, about this. upholstered back, uh -huh. which is that kind of form is not something that you would normally see. In Peter Meyer. But that goes with the table. That and could work with the table. And it looks very nice with the table because Art Deco was highly inspired by Peter Meyer. Oh, was it, was it before, after? Art Deco is about 100 years after Peter Meyer. Peter Meyer period, the original period was 1815 to 1830, and Art Deco was really 1920 to 1930. And where was Peter Meyer? From what part of the country, and where, where was Art Deco? Well, the the Bieter, original Biedermeyer era was actually a whole socioeconomic phenomena that happened in Austria-Hungary uh, after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, and it lasted till technically till eight, 1848. But the true style really started to peter out by about 1835. Later on, it got um, the northern countries like Swedish Biedermeyer, which okay. is very popular in the United States. That came later. That was a little bit later, and it doesn't have the same pedigree as to where the actual style originated. It, is it different color wood, the Scandinavian? It tends to be much lighter. They use a lot of <coughs> birch wood, which is not native to Austria and, and Germany. So they do use the style, but they use what is in their country. That's so right. So it designates what you call it. And the forms are a little different. We like, to, we like to specialize in the Vienna form because that was a very high style. That was very lyrical and um, it was a very elegant form, very modern, very much more modern for its age than anything else. Did a lot of people buy it? Were people buying it during the 1800s? Or were they buying other kinds of furniture? Well, what preceded that particular style was the Empire style, which was all about uh, empire, and it was about um, the forms before that were about the aristocracy, and there was a repudiation of the aristocracy after the, um, after the French Revolution to some extent, and the style that emerged was more about the, the rising mercantile class, which wasn't, didn't, wasn't landed gentry, but they were very, very wealthy, and there was sort of a purist simplicity of form that that evolved. But, but everyone couldn't buy that kind of furniture. It was still a class kind of thing. Well, I think everything back then was a class kind yes, of thing. It <laughs> and it certainly <clears throat> took quite a lot of time to create the pieces. So. so when you go to find those pieces still in Europe, do you still find them? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in various states of, uh, of, of repair, shall we say, but we still find pieces and they, they still circulate around. And you restore, you, can re you know how to restore them, obviously, since you've worked in the shop. Well, our, we, have, uh, we have old world craftsmen who do the restoration. It takes um, many, many hours to polish out a piece to the level that we will actually market it at. Then what does that polish out? What does that mean? Well, the polish is actually made of um, shellac. It's uh, originally ground, uh, ground beetles that come from India. It was something that was just discovered really at the end of the 18th century. Does it, that gives it a hardness. Does it give it a color as well? It gives it a honey color. Oh, it does? It, yes, it's kind of honey color. It, it dissolves in, in alcohol and it's hand rubbed. So it's uh, with a circular motion and it's a layer after layer and you have to let it dry and then you rub it out and you let it dry and you rub it out and let it so dry. So you're building Building a, up layers. You're building a, a finish on top? That's correct. It's like a mirror almost, It is and it magnifies it? the uh, veneers which are so beautiful. Are there, I, I'm going to just show one more thing, then I'm going to ask you who the collectors are. Tell us what this is. That's, uh, that's a Biedermeyer chandelier. Now that's made of a carved fruit wood, so it might look like uh, something heavier than it really is. It might only weigh about 15 pounds. It, this is what it looks like. It's metal of some sort. No, actually it's carved wood, and then it has what's called, it's a water gilded surface. So. Um, it's, it's actually, the wood is covered with a gesso clay material, and then that is um, adhered with very, very fine 23 karat gold leaf. I was going to ask you about 23 karat water gilding, because you seem to be an expert in it. What, it. what takes place with that, and why do you need the water? Well, it's in contrast to an oil base, which is much more even, it doesn't have the 
the um, complexity that a water gilded surface has because you rub it on and you can bring the gesso. There's different color clays underneath. So when you see a piece like that, it has a little reddish tone, or you could use a yellow gesso. And the gilt, the, sometimes you can buff it out so that some of the red comes through, or sometimes you can oh. leave it matte. So you can really manipulate the surface. That, so, so that's what water gilding is, mm -hmm. as opposed to, what did you say, oil? Oil, an oil based, oh. which is much flatter. It's not as interesting. Well. We've learned so much today. <laughs> We've learned a lot. But what about the people who collect? Do they know as much as you've taught us today? Well, we try to educate them. <laughs> we actually have an extensive website at uh, www.iliadantique.com. And on there, we have a page on restoration. We have a page on about Biedermeyer. What so to it's look educational. For. Yes, we feel that educating people really helps them make a decision oh, on see. how to purchase a very precious object. I see. Who buys uh, these precious objects? I know you have a celebrity base that who collect. Well, in New York, we have certainly a, a large Fortune 500 profile, uh, which is what you'll find in New York. We have some celebrities there who purchase, for example, Mary Tyler Moore. Um, do they have a lot of pieces or do they have just like one show piece? They tend to have a variety of pieces into which uh, Biedermeyer will fit into. So but if they get one on the great chest or one great table? They might fit in with other neoclassical pieces. Um, someone like Barbara Streisand, who's a great collector, from what I understand she has a big collection of Biedermeyer. So it really depends on the individual collector. Well, I'm so glad you were with us today. Well, thank you. Andrea, thank you for being with us. And don't you go away because we'll be right back with George Carr, who wrote a book on Zach Carr. Welcome back. I'm Joan Quinn with author, actor, George Carr. George was born and raised in Texas. After graduating from the University of Texas, he headed to New York City to work for Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren as marketing executive there. But after he did some marketing, there was a big turnaround, wasn't there? And you heard a conversation and you ended up in acting class. I was at Nails one night uh, in New York City with a friend of mine and I overheard Billy Baldwin talking. I don't think he knows his story. And he talked about being at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. And these words just hit me and changed me around. And the next morning I was at Lee Strasberg <laughs> auditioning to be an actor. And here you were this highly uh, fabulous executive position at these two great places? I had wonderful, uh, great jobs, uh, worldwide, first class, private jets, amazing staffs and secretaries, and I think it was 1989, 4th of July, I told Calvin, I said, I have to leave. And uh, it's interesting, I left 4th of July, 1989, and my brother, Zach, uh, we went back to Texas and made a pilgrimage to every city that we had ever lived in so I could touch every person who had touched me as a child before I started acting. So that you could use that as an yes. actor? Yes. Uh, the first person we met was my mother's obstetrician who had <laughs> delivered Zach, myself, and my other brother, Peter. She was in her 80s then, and she was the first person who touched me, and she's the first person I touched when I started acting. Oh, how brilliant. Oh, it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> you took acting, then you did some off-Broadway shows. I did off-Broadway, uh, TV, commercials. You did BBC, you did AbFab. I did AbFab. I was the maitre d' to the two crazies at the um, Russian Tea Room. Wonderful, and underneath all their kind of craziness, very highly professional women and taught me a lot about comedy. Hopefully I can get to use it someday. 
Yeah, they're wonderful, uh, both of them in their own way. Very much. In England, they've been trained classically. That's why they can do that slapstick, funny, you know. And very smart ladies, very smart. You wrote a play and produced it and starred in it um, at the Hudson Theater in L.A. When did you come to L.A.? Let's move you to L.A. first. I got here in 1997, and it's interesting, the week before I left, uh, my brother Zach said, George, my feet hurt. And, you know, just a basic foot problem. I told him that he could borrow my Birkenstocks for the weekend, and off we go, and I move out here. And uh, I was in my acting class with my first acting teacher, Ellen Gerstein, who's been a mentor to me. And uh, one day, a play just popped out of me. A that was Hole? Hole, uh, W-H-O-L-E, 19 characters, 19 speaking parts, a full play I had never written. And all of a sudden, it was being produced at the Hudson Avenue and it was the most amazing event of my life. You didn't do all 19 parts. No, uh, no. <laughs> because Chaz Palminteri did a, a one-person play and played all these different characters. <laughs> it, at one point, my director said that I should do them all, but um, I said no. No, uh, we had a wonderful cast, wonderful actors, and then two years later, it was picked up by Expanded Arts Theater in New York City as an off-Broadway show. Oh. And this was a dream come true. Uh, my brother, who by this time, this simple foot problem, had turned into a major life-threatening disease. We're talking about your brother, just to let our audience know, because this is the book you've written. And yes, it's called Zach Carr. So we're leading our audience through your acting career and how you were with Calvin Klein. And your brother was also with Calvin Klein. He was the artistic director for 30 years. 30 years. Uh, so we're kind of bringing the audience along in this way. So uh, my opening night in New York City uh, was the most amazing event because it, my actors, my director, producers, we were all together. And here was my brother in the audience. But by this time, he was in a wheelchair. Uh, he, his cancer that he had uh, is called Poem Syndrome. And it has a uh, crippling aspect to it. And so this little comment about his foot hurting several years later would actually be a terminal fatal uh, para paralyzing disease. And, but in the audience that night was Calvin and my brother and all of my actor friends and all of my fashion friends seeing this play that I had written and being produced in New York City. Were you acting in it? That one I didn't. I just you did it in LA, in LA, but you didn't do it in New York. Not in New York. Uh, I said, just let them do it and just come and enjoy it. So, so what about Empty Kisses? That's another thing that you wrote. <laughs> this is uh, my new baby. Uh, Empty Kisses is a screenplay that I've co-authored uh, with another writer and actor, Chris Prince. This is, uh, we're hoping this to go studio. It's about a young woman who meets a young man. And usually in these type of stories, it's the guy who's bad and has to be tamed. But in Empty Kisses, Gwen is bad. <laughs> and, but we love Gwen, I hope. And she's bad, and she has to be tamed. And uh, eventually, she is tamed. And although she's had many empty kisses, by the end of the movie, she's had now one full kiss. You were in New York, and you came here. You were successful on stage writing. Now, have you decided to stay in Hollywood and write and act? Yes. Uh, I have an apartment in New York City. I go back and forth. And it was interesting. Uh, just recently, a friend of mine from LA was in New York with me. And she said, George, how can you give up New York City? You know everyone. But this crazy city, Los Angeles, is my home now. And it owns me. And I don't really understand why, but it does. Better than Texas? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think when I'm about 85, I'll end back up in Texas, you know, kind of like a curmudgeon. So out of Zach's illness and what he left to you came this book. But you had all the information in front of you. You had the croaky books, which uh, were the things that designers do. 
Tell us what a croquis book is. Croquis is a French term for sketch, and these are croquis books. Uh, designers will write in them. They're kind of like journals, how we would write daily diaries, but they sketch in them. And uh, by the late 90s, my brother's disease had taken over him so badly that he had to be at home. Uh, he was wheelchair bound or uh, bedridden. And he could no longer design professionally. He could not, uh, he was on disability. And for the first time in his life, he was free to design for himself. And he laid in bed, crippled with uh, a fatal cancer, sketching. And writing. And writing and designing and keeping diaries, a uh, list of things to do. I'm going to just turn the page while you're talking and then just show how um, spontaneous these things are, just page after page. It's very, it's uh, the quality is amazing, the quantity is, um, is just, uh, it's prolific. Uh, by the time he died, he had left me thousands of these sketches. And uh, being an artist myself, uh, I realized that his art needed an audience. And to keep them at home in my closet or drawer just was not right. So uh, his friends uh, helped me, and we have produced a book, and we... Tell us about the art directing. This book is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to see if I can take... Oh, sorry. I'm going to just take this down and open it, because the way it's art directed is brilliant. Tell us about this art director. Well, I'm the luckiest person in the world. Zach was greatly loved by his friends. And uh, Sam Shahid, who is a uh, advertiser and art director in New York. Um, was is, he a good friend uh, of his? He was actually a gentleman who said, George, you have a book. I simply wanted to make a donation to Parsons, and Sam said you had a book. So he held my hand and uh, helped me do this book for my brother. And it's all of Zach's drawings, Zach's photography, Zach's writing. We have personal diaries. And these are actually replications from the croquis books, just the way he would put it. But the way he put them together, he has writing and color and it's just the most beautiful book, Snapshots. These are, Zach, <laughs> like Andy Warhol, uh, carried a camera with him at all times. And when we came to the section on his years with Calvin, how do we do this justice? So we did all of Zach's pictures of all of his friends at Calvin Klein, and he's smiling in all these pictures. So he was very happy there. And uh, we were printed by the world's foremost printer in Germany, a Mr. Gerhard Steidel. It's the finest paper and uh, ink reproduction. So it's, uh, the book is, I'm thrilled. Did you have any kind of input yourself? Oh, yes. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, you actually don't write anything in here, do you? Oh, I, yes, ma'am, I do. I uh, have a, uh, a, I wrote a, bio a biography on my brother. Oh, you wrote the foreword? The foreword and, uh, oh, for those I people see. who didn't know my brother. I and I, what I learned was it was as much as my story as his because we had been so close and lived through all oh, these periods like that, together. Yeah. And uh, I wrote a poem for him oh, that's in. Right. And well, did you do individual uh, interviews? Yes, we uh, contacted uh, approximately 150 of Zach's closest friends and asked them to give us stories. And uh, uh, 80 people replied, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, Kelly Klein, Anna Wintour the, with Vogue magazine, Grace Coddington, Narcissa Rodriguez, all of his wonderful fin friends responded. Grace and Narcissa worked with him at Calvin, yes. right? Yes. Tell it, there were some stories about those. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Narcissa, actually, I knew first, uh, I had been doing some freelance work for Anne Klein to support myself as an actor and uh, <laughs> Always doing something to support yourself. Uh, and Narcissa was working there, and then he and I became friends, and he would go to Calvin Klein, and of course he and Zach became best buddies, and uh, Narcissa has been a true supporter and friend of mine through this experience also. But he left Calvin. He left. He's on his own right now. He's a star designer getting major press and is doing very well. And. Uh, he was just with me last week in New York where we had some beautiful openings, as was Grace Coddington. And, uh, at art schools, at the art school, yes. which is great because he came out of the art school. He supported the art school. And all these designers come out of those fashion art right. schools. Uh, when, as I remember, when I was in high school, we were in high school, Zach was 19 years old. And uh, this is back in the 60s. And he called the House of Saint Laurent in Paris. <laughs> 
and went to see a show at Saint Laurent. They just let him come. And they just, in those <laughs> days, you know, this crazy kid from Texas called. And he was always, you know, scouring Life magazines and Look magazines for uh, fashion design. And again, I had to give his art back so the youth of today could look at it. These two uh, drawings are also on the set, were drawings that he did that you've yeah. framed and brought in. Uh, this sketch is actually one of Zach's from the mid-80s. He had his own business for one year. Uh, he took a oh, right. kind of sabbatical from Calvin. And he also uh, did a whole section of fine art that I love showing. Most people don't know Zach as a fine artist, but things other than fashion. The, the thing, that fine art, that drawing, translated uh, to a, this T-shirts that were sold for charity. Yes, we're tying in with cancer charities and um, youth programs and art programs across the world and offering them the ability to buy these uh, Zach related products with his images to sell for uh, and to raise money for charities, etc. And you do something else with the Episcopal Church, which I thought was wonderful. Yes, um, we're lifelong Episcopalians and uh, the church has been good to me. And uh, one of Zach's sketches uh, is called The Human Cross. And I'm oh, this is the one? Working with the Episcopal Church. Uh, we just started here in Beverly Hills offering this. Uh, and we're going to hopefully go nationwide with it where the church can use it to raise money for the art programs in their churches. Oh, that's such a great thing. And um, did Calvin bless this book? Yes. Uh, I've kept Calvin abreast of everything. You know, it's funny, Sam himself at Zach's funeral said, he said, George, he said, if it wasn't for Calvin, we all wouldn't be here. So Calvin is kind of our father figure, our mentor. I get teased all the time for looking like him. I take it like a compliment. Um, You're he's, taller. <laughs> <laughs> he's always with us, and uh, I kept him abreast of everything, and he thought the book was brilliant. And the book is brilliant. It's called Zach Carr and Powerhouse Press, who does so many art books. Yes. They do wonderful art books. And I'm so happy that you came on, told us a little about your career, and told us about keeping the spirit of your brother alive. Well, thank you. I, have, I told you I had a little secret. When Zach was on uh, the Today Show with Bryant Gumbel in the 80s, uh, he told Bryant um, all about his clothes and at the end of his interview he did something for Bryant that was so charming and I want to do it for you tonight and that's just to shake your hand. Oh thank, thank you. you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks George. George Carr, thank you for watching and keep writing to 777 South Figueroa 44th floor Los Angeles 917 and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. That's great. Honey, you are good. Doesn't look so wonderful. <laughs>